Hello again, everyone. I'm Joe Longinusa, welcoming you to another edition of Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, the show where industry leaders, golf professionals, and legends all come and discuss the great game we love so much. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our host to tell us who's next on the tee. Chris, take it away. Hey, thank you, Joe. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me again today on Next on the Tee. We are brought to you today by the great folks over at the French Lick Resort, an absolutely spectacular place. Their Pete Dye and Donald Ross design courses were ranked number one and number two in the state of Indiana by Golf Week. It was the site of last year's Senior PGA Championship and the LPGA Legends Championship. Go to FrenchLick.com to see for yourself how great it is and how you can book your stay. We are also sponsored by our friends over at The Leather Shop, makers of top quality, custom-made leather, dress, casual, and golf shoes. Folks, do your feet a favor and put them inside shoes. They're going to keep them feeling good and looking good all day long. You can find out more information about them online at the-leather-shop.com. Also want to give a shout out to our good friends over at the World Golf Village located in historic St. Augustine, Florida. Was down there last week uh, on our annual guy trip with my buddies. What a wonderful time we had down there. Can't thank those folks enough for making our stay fantastic. It's also the home of the World Golf Hall of Fame. Folks, no matter the time of year or the length of your visit, the World Golf Village is sure to deliver an experience with family and friends. They're going to help you make memories. They're going to last you a lifetime. For more information, visit them online at worldgolfvillage.com. Give them a call, 1-800-948-4653. Plus, a shout-out to a couple of our new friends. First, over at the PGA Tour Superstore, you know, which I call a golf wonderland and the best place to get everything that you need to look good and play great out on the golf course. Check out all of their great items, from golf balls to clubs to range finders and so much more at pgatoursuperstore.com. Also, the, at the Jones Global Sports and the Bobby Jones Company, folks, really outstanding stuff, both from, you know, apparel that you can wear, right, and uh, great golf equipment. Raise your game to new heights in performance with a brand that's been known for st- uh, style, character, and excellence for the last 25 years, and that's the Bobby Jones Company. They have an inspired collection of products that capitalize on fabric technology to, look, to deliver a modern look and performance while honoring the legacy of Mr. Bobby Jones, and it's going to deliver promising, enduring style that you're going to be very proud to have on when you're out there on the golf course or just in your everyday life. They work hard to earn your respect, your trust, your business, and just as important, your long-term friendship. Communicate that you're here to stay by wearing clothes from a brand that has been uh, known for enduring style and performance and plus presence. The Bobby Jones Company. Check out all their great styles online at bobbyjones.com. And while you're there on their site, click on the equipment link to see the great line of drivers, fairway woods, hybrids, and putters designed by one of the game's most influential and the equipment designers, and that's Mr. Jesse Ortiz. His father, Lou, and, uh, and Bobby Jones himself uh, share a great passion for the game of golf, and so does Jesse, and great golf club design. Remember, the great tri-metal fairway woods uh, from Jesse's days as uh, you know, you know, lead designer there at Olimar Golf, and now he's putting that innovative designs and uh, his great creative mind uh, into equipment for the Bobby Jones Company. Check, in, check them out online. You can go there direct by going to bobbyjonesclubs.com. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and today I have uh, two great guests that I am looking forward to sharing with you. First up is that great golf club designer, Jesse Ortiz. So honored to have Jesse with me this morning. We're going to talk about his father and how he started the Olimar brand from a horse stable out in San Francisco and growing that brand with their persimmon woods into, you know, one of the great brands in, in, in the game of golf had great players like, you know, Johnny Miller and Ken Ventura using their clubs out on tour back in the day. And uh, Jesse's low profile tri-metal design really took that company from being a $3 million company to a hundred million dollar company in just two years. Now he's creating and designing equally as great golf equipment for the Bobby Jones brand. We'll talk about all of that and so much more when Jesse joins me here in just a few minutes. Following Jesse, Joe Groman is going to be here. Joe is the head professional out at the uh, Navy golf course at Seal Beach in Cypress, California. He has a rich history at that golf course, uh, particularly playing with and watching the development of a game of, uh, by one of the greats that uh, you may be aware of, and that's Tiger Woods. That's where Tiger Woods got his start. 
So uh, we'll talk about uh, talk about that and you know everything that Joe has been doing. So many great things that Joe is a part of. So look forward to having him as part of the show about 25 minutes from now. So we've got another great lineup in store for you this morning. I'm so glad that you're here to take the journey with me over the next hour or so. And like I mentioned a moment ago, Next on Tea is brought to you by our friends over at the French Lick Resort up in French Lick, Indiana. Folks, you want to talk about a spectacular resort to both play golf and just relax and enjoy yourself. Well, you need to go check out the French Lick Resort, and you can find them online by going to FrenchLick.com to see for yourself. But let's hear a word from our friends up there. This is the time to play legendary golf at French Lick Resort. Book one of our money-saving packages like the Hall of Fame package and play our Pete Dye and Donald Ross courses. Stay in historic luxury at our French Lick or West Baden Springs hotels. Relax in our spas. Dine in our restaurants. Have some gaming fun in the casino. Or just rock on our rambling verandas like they did 100 years ago. Go online to FrenchLick.com and book your legendary golf getaway now at French Lick Resort. Yeah, folks, I've been up there, played the Pete Dye and Donald Ross courses. They're absolutely spectacular. My family and I, we can't wait to get up there later this year. The French Lick Resort needs to be on your list of places to stay and play. And oh, by the way, my friends, they also have a casino right there on the property as well. Again, for more information to book your stay, go to FrenchLick.com. And every week here on Next on the T, we like to kick off the show by saluting the brave men and women serving in every branch of our military who are tuning in around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. We want to thank all of you for the daily sacrifices that you and your families are making to protect our freedoms and our liberties. We also want to thank our veterans for all that you and your families have done for us over the years. It is through your strength and your efforts that our way of life is even possible. Folks, if you happen to see a member of our military when you're out and about, whether it's in the airport, at a restaurant, at the grocery store, wherever you may be, please stop for a moment and tell them thank you. They are our true heroes. We also want to give our thanks uh, to Sean Cruz and the wonderful folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. It is such an honor for us to have Next on the TV a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. And I want to continue to remind our veterans out there, please be sure to continue to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org. What a great site with news and articles and a wealth of information designed specifically for our veterans out there that I'm sure you're going to find both interesting and beneficial to you. Again, globalvoiceforveterans.org. All right, now joining me on the French Lick Resort guest line is one of the game's most influential equipment designers, and you heard me talk about him a minute ago, and that's Mr. Jesse Ortiz. Let me give you some more background on Jesse. He started making clubs back in 1968 and was instrumental in growing the Olimar Golf Company into a $100 million business thanks to his tri-metal, low-profile design metalwoods, which are regarded among the most innovative ever introduced into the golf industry. Jesse now designs clubs for the Bobby Jones brand. His driver's fairway woods utility clubs have received heavy acclaim in places like Golf Digest and have been on their hot list starting back in 2006. In 2013, Golf Magazine named them Best Hybrids. In 1999, Jesse received the International Network of Golf Business Achievement Award and was recognized as the Entrepreneur of the Year by Northern California and in Northern California by Ernst & Young. And boy, I could just go on and on the list of awards and recognitions that Jesse has received, has received, but I am very excited to say that he is here with me this morning on next on the T. Good morning, Jesse. Thank you for joining me. Good morning, Chris. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that introduction. It's, uh, it, I, I, I don't, I didn't know who you were talking about there, <laughs> but I guess <laughs> I've been, I've been in the business so long, kind of like the old Bob Hope line, you know, if you're around long enough, they start giving you a bunch of awards, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, so Jesse, let's let's kind of you know rewind the tape. Let's let's go back to the beginning. When when did you first start playing the game? And uh, was it your father Lou who put the first clubs in your hands? Well, yeah, it's kind of an interesting story. My dad uh, was an immigrant from uh, the Basque country in uh, in northern Spain. Came here to the United States as a merchant uh, seaman. Ended up uh, staying in San Francisco, and was a machinist. And working in a big shop that was making parts for turbines, water uh, turbines to for um, Hetch Hetchy, PG and E. And he got in. He had a friend of his who got got him interested in making golf clubs. I, I'm fond of saying that my dad was probably the only man in the history of the game to make clubs and not 
initially play the game. You know, he was just making parts. Gee, a golf club was, was just no different than any other kind of part to a machine. Uh, and so my dad eventually started Olimar Golf Company in 1960, but he really didn't take up the game until about 64, 65. So it's kind of wow. kind of interesting. And then he, then he became a, a fanatic golfer and, and just loved playing until, uh, until he couldn't play anymore. Um, and uh, it was just that, – that's how – he got me interested. Actually, actually, Chris, you know, when you're talking about your old European families, um, you don't get, you, you don't choose to go into the family business. You get drafted, you know. And all of a sudden, <laughs> if you're able-bodied and you've got hands, uh, uh, whether it was starting to sweep around the shop when I was uh, 10 years old, or, or by the time I was 13, 14, I was actually working on the clubs. So that's how that's how I got my start in the golf equipment industry. Yeah, and, you know, and, and I read that, you know, the, the actual birth, and you talk about making parts for other things, but I, I read that, you know, the birth of the company was in a horse stable? Is that home yeah, in San that's Francisco? right. It was, yeah, in, south of Market, it was in the kind of a rundown area. It was an industrial area, and it was just a, uh, it was really a shack. It was, it was an old horse stable uh, on Harrison Street, um, about a block away from the Burgermeister and Ham's breweries, which were big in those days in the in the late 50s so um it was a horse stable and my first job was to uh, sweep it up and get the coffee cans that were filling with water because when it rained it was it, more water would come off the roof than it, it was raining more inside the building than outside so that was my first job and uh, uh then we moved over to oakland uh and we were there for about oh wow i'm gonna see we we're there about 20 years and then we we went to uh, Hayward, which is where the company then really exploded. Mm -hmm. And he, he and the company were known for making great persimmon woods, right? That were that were used by guys like you know Johnny Miller and Tony Lima, Ken Venturi out on tour. Talk about you know how how did he get you know great players like that to start you know giving his uh, his golf uh, his golf clubs a try? Well, I, I think we were very unique, and we used to select all the special persimmon blocks and in those days you had to you you, you would make a, a master out of aluminum and from there they would do the wood turnings you would get a thousand blocks of wood or flinches as they used to call them and as you turned them down some of the wood would be very high quality other type of wood wouldn't be but you would have to accept whatever the um, the companies that were producing or cutting down the persimmon trees you'd have to accept what they were giving you. So um, we were very, very selective. If we got 1,000 blocks, maybe three or 400 would be the ones that would make it out to the public. The others we would just burn and throw away, where other companies, they used everything. They would paint the clubs black. They would fill them with lead. We, My dad used to say, if you have garbage and you throw it up in the air, it's not going to land somewhere else but on top of your head. So you have to put out stuff that's really good and my dad had a way with facing the clubs in those days chris there wasn't a real science on bulge and roll and there was something about the way that my dad hand faced his clubs that made them perform better not just what the materials that we were using the type of wood we were using so a lot of the pros that used to come in even if they were using other brands of clubs they would stop at the shop and they would have my dad actually rework the faces and the hosel areas to have that right look and the right uh, bulge and roll so that they could compress the ball perfectly. And that's really how, it's, how it started. But there was, my, my dad's persimmon woods were ha always had a very distinctive look. They, they were clean. The grain was always explosive. It just looked gorgeous. They, these clubs always looked like a work of art compared to what, else, what everything else was on the market. So uh, talk about, you know, like I say, you had, you had Johnny Miller and Tony Lee and Ken Venturi out there playing the clubs. What was it like being around those guys back in the day? <laughs> it was, it, well, I, I was very uh, impressionable. I was very impressed with the people that, that came in. You know, I, I got to meet a lot of the, the great golfers, uh, Trevino, uh, Johnny. Johnny Miller used to pick me up uh, from lessons on Saturdays because all the local kids – all the top players out of California um, were hanging around 
my dad's shop in the uh, in the early 60s, and I would be taking golf lessons at a nearby golf course on Saturday mornings. And these young players like Miller and the Lotz brothers and Rod Funseth and Bobby Smith and names that became popular on the tour in, in the mid-60s, uh, they, had, they didn't have any place to play on Saturdays because the country clubs were off limits to them uh, on weekends. So they couldn't go until late in the afternoon to play and practice there. So they would come and hang out at my dad's shop and my dad would send one of them over after my lessons in the morning and pick me up. So I didn't know if Rod Funseth or Bobby Lunn or Bob Smith or, or Johnny Miller would come and pick me up and, and take me back to the shop where I could work the rest of the afternoon. But it was always a treat to see the the, the really good players, uh, Ray Floyd. I mean, there were, there were a whole bunch of tour players that would come by in the 1960s and it always impressed me, Chris, that here was a man who spoke broken English, uh, had was from modest modest means, and he was able to make a product that impressed the best players in the world. I never took I never took that for granted. It was it was quite amazing. So Jesse, when when did you first start you know tinkering around with golf clubs? When did your father start letting you play around with the equipment and uh, get your start you know being a you know being the great golf club designer you are today? Well, by the time I was 12 years old, I was throwing grips on and uh, cutting shafts, um, epoxying the inserts in. But I think really by the time I was about 15 or 16, so I had been already working on clubs for about four years. About the time I was 15, 16, he trusted me to work directly with the tour pros when they came in. So I was already wow. filing faces and grinding irons and doing all that stuff by the time I was about 15 or 16 years old. So uh, it, was, it was quite an experience. Because of that, I never I got very good at doing what I was supposed to do, but it didn't give me much time, Chris, to play golf. And so I just remember that as a, as a junior golfer, um, I'd be playing in tournaments and getting getting uh, my uh, getting beat like a drum by all the <laughs> local kids who were using our clubs to beat me, and everyone would say, "Jesse, you know, I, hey, I thought you'd be a better golfer, man. I mean, you're you're the Olimar guy." And it, I said, "Hey, well, every time you guys hit are hitting buckets of balls, I'm grinding some clubs and getting shop dust all over me." So, you know, as, as my dad used to say, "Chris, you this, you know, Segovia doesn't make." guitars you know it's uh, he plays them so golf's the same way you can either make the clubs or you play the clubs and you're going to make the clubs and that's the way it was that was the way. but but i've learned to enjoy the game and and i play a decent game but i always i always just have fun so uh, the, the other piece you know the olimar where did the olimar name and brand come from originally um there were there were three partners uh, the, if you recall earlier in the conversation, I said one of my dad's buddies got him interested in in gol- making golf clubs, and that right. man's name was Pe- Pedro Liendo. Pedro Liendo, and he was working at the time for a company called Frankwist and Johnson in Colma, which they were making the Tony Lima and the Ken Venturi line of clubs. It was a small company out in Colma, which is just south of San Francisco. They would pick up their clubs there, Chris, and then immediately take them over to my dad to be reworked, you know. So <laughs> they were getting paid by F and J to to use use the clubs. So Liendo got my dad involved. So my dad is the O R right. in Orlamar. L I was Liendo and they didn't have any money to to um wire up the horse stable uh, with with electricity, or the type of electricity that they needed, 220 wiring. So they got their buddy uh, Emilio Martinez, who was an electrician, to do the electrical work. And since they couldn't pay him, they made him a partner. So that's how it became <laughs> Orly Mar. Kind of an in, again a modest beginning for uh, for for a company that you know eventually that Martinez never uh, worked at the company, and Liendo left after two or three years. So my dad was left holding the bag with the company and made, made it what, what it became, you know, it's, it's a very proud and wonderful story. Mm-hmm. So Jesse, take us through, you know, how you guys went from, you know, using persimmon to, to make your woods. And then, you know, you became so successful. The company explodes when you kind of, you know, you introduce your design and now you're starting to use, you know, the tri-metal design and the low profile. So you're using steel and copper, 
versus you know persimmon. Yeah, it's well everything changed when uh, when TaylorMade came out. Metalwoods were became really became the rage. My dad and I we never really believed much in shows you how how brilliant we were. We didn't believe much in metal woods because we just thought that a wood wood would perform better, particularly in a fairway wood, uh, because you can lower the center of gravity much much more with a wood wood than you could with a metal wood. Metal woods, if you recall, Chris, were perimeter weighted. They were hollow. Mm -hmm. Where wood, when we were using laminated maple, you could put a real heavy sole plate on the bottom of the club and the ball would just would easily go go higher, would launch higher. So during the whole metal wood thing, my dad and I resisted it because we we knew that our fairway woods were superior. But nobody wanted to hear about that. Once once metal wood came metal woods came in, the floodgates were open. But we continued with metal with uh, with our fairway woods for about another 12, 13 years and did very well on the west coast. Out, out here on the west coast, everyone knew that our fairway woods were were spectacular, but uh, when Bertha came out, then that was the end of the story. That changed everything. Now all of a sudden you had to be oversized, you had to be metal, and we struggled for several years. And I finally told my dad, "Look, Pop, we gotta. If we can't beat these son of a guns, we gotta join them. We gotta make a metal wood." And my dad said, "No, no metal wood. You know, yeah, the, the CG's not good." And 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 so I said, "No, let me try. Let me try doing something here." And I realized, Chris, that a wood wood was a multi-material product. Like you said, a, a wood wood was either l- laminated or persimmon. It would have an aluminum or a heavy brass sole plate. The face insert was a fiber insert. You'd have stainless steel screws to hold the insert in. You'd have the plastic whipping cord. The club head of a wood was multi-material. And it didn't make sense to me that a metal wood should be all titanium or all stainless steel it didn't make sense you could you could if you could get a, find a way to mix up the metals that you use in the construction of the head you could shift the weight in the club to make it perform better so take it away from being the typical perimeter weighted metal wood and you can make it into a sole weighted metal wood and by thinning out the walls in different spots you could move the cg around and the only way to do that was to come up with different materials. And the whole industry was into titanium. And I realized from a metallurgist buddy of mine who said, Jesse, there's some high-strength steel alloys that are much superior than titanium if you're going to make a smaller head. And I started experimenting with that. And that's when I stumbled on these, uh, these uh, type of steels that Car- uh, Carpenter Metals out of Pennsylvania was making. And I put two and two together and it came out to five and that became the tri metal. You know, I, 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 when I designed tri metal, uh, Adams had been out with a shallow face club, but I knew that that was just building the bridge halfway across. It was, it wasn't tri metal. Wasn't just a, a shallow face club. It was a multi-material metal wood. And today, Chris, every fairway wood or hybrid on the market, from TaylorMade to Callaway to, to, to Titleist, every one of them uses the tri-metal platform to make their clubs. They are all using high-strength wow. steel alloys instead of the normal stainless steel, which is what everyone was using in 1997 uh, when I came out with tri-metal. So, talk. You mentioned you know you experimented with different things. Give us an idea. Talk about some of the experiments that you did, and in, in, you know what got you to you know what this is the one. Well, I knew per, pretty quickly that that if I could find a type of stainless steel or a mar aging steel, uh, they're both different types of steels. I knew that if I could find something that had uh, greater strength, make it thinner, and because I could make it thinner. I would be able to move weight away from the face, which is you know the front wall, and be able to slug it down below. So up until then, Chris, the, all the stainless metal woods had faces that were at least four millimeters thick, and I knew that well if I can take if I can take this material and make it only make it less than than two millimeters, that then I could save half the weight, and in the face plate. 
that would be about 20 grams. 20 grams is a lot. So I knew just basically from I knew just from the basics of working with wood woods and how I could move weight around depending on the material that I used because the wood was kind of weightless. I knew pretty quickly that this club was going to be very easy to hit for the average golfer off the fairway, and that's what a lot of average golfers struggle with is the fairway woods uh, getting the ball airborne. So I knew right away that this was going to be a great club for the average golfer. What took me by surprise, and I had no idea, was that by thinning out the face, I was creating a hotter face with more trampoline and coupled with the bulge and roll that my dad had taught me, because before that, um, none of the other metal woods really had the proper bulge and roll, but I put, I put the bulge and roll of a wood wood on a metal wood. And when you combine that with the much thinner face, you got a different sound, you got a different feel, the ball came off, came off the face hotter with less spin, and it was real, really quickly, 100 days after I introduced that club to the market, it became the number one club on the PGA Tour. And it was the first time and the only time, and it'll never happen again, that a club that nobody is paid to play gets to number one in usage. It'll mm. never happen again. And uh, the big companies will make sure that that'll never happen again. They're never going to get caught looking the other direction when some hillbilly out of Northern California comes up with a better <laughs> mousetrap. They'll never get caught again. They'll, they've bought their way into the tour so that some small company that's innovative will never have a chance to get back in and make the impact that I made. So, you know, to that, to that point, Jesse, you know, the, the opportunity now, for the great things you're doing for the Bobby Jones company and the, and the great com, you know, clubs that you're making for them is the only way to get, you know, you know, to your point back out on tour is to have, you know, a young amateur that may look at, you know, you may get the club, you know, in their hands, his or her hands and they go, boy, I really love this. And they start playing. Is that the only way to get back? You know, like, you know to get to, to your point, to get to a Jordan speed, to Jason day, you know, named the great player of the day right now. Right? You're never going to get in their hands anymore, to your point. No, Is- no, you, you can't do it. It starts in college now where college teams are sponsored either by Ping or by Titleist or something. And, and um, you know, it was, it was kind of like that back in my day, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s. But um, it's gotten a lot tougher now. The kids are The kids are earmarked real quickly, and as soon as they qualify for – during you know during Q school the the manufacturers are there like like bees all over uh, you know the bees all over the hive and when you make it you immediately you're coming off the 18th green and there you're hounded by the major manufacturers and and they're with with agents signing you up either to play the balls play play the clubs um, whatever and it's it's just a completely different. Uh, game and, and it's too bad because one of the reasons that the game is uh, we're plateauing or actually declining it, one of the reasons given is that innovation has been has been stifled and I think part of that is uh, the control that the major manufacturers have in in buying up and locking lock, buying up the players and locking out the small companies that truly brought innovative product designs to the marketplace. You know, it, 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 it's, it's obvious that Ping at one point was a tiny company and Karsten created an incredible product. Ping was a small company at one time. TaylorMade was a small company at one time. Callaway was a small company at one time. And they created a breakthrough product that launched them uh, into the big time. But true innovation no longer comes from the big companies. They play it safe. So now you're, like I say, you're designing, you know, clubs for the Bobby Jones brand, right? And talk about how, you know, that partnership, you know, came into being. How did you, how did you uh, convince the, you know, the heirs of, uh, of Bobby Jones that, you know what, you know, I still do a, a really great job at creating clubs, which you do. And, you know, now it's a great marriage between, you know, your, your knowledge and design and a, and a great brand. Well, I left Olimar in 2004, 
and the company had gotten real big, we, real big, real fast, Chris. And uh, we brought in investors, and it's almost the whole Silicon Valley story where a small company, very innovative, gets big. It needs money to grow, so you bring in investors. Pretty soon, the investor group starts uh, telling you what to do, and things go sideways. There's inter- internal issues, and the company started to flounder. We were, we were still a, a $40 million company when I left. Uh, I just wasn't happy in, with the direction we were going, and so I left. And I was wondering what I was going to do, and I read an article um, in the Wall Street Journal, and it said that the Jones family uh, was talking about the apparel company, and that they were looking for for to put their name um, the Jones name on equipment. And my partner at the time, uh, Walter Rosenthal, called me up and said, you know, hey Jesse, would you be interested in doing something with the Jones family? And I said, well, yeah, you know, I'll, I, I'd consider it. So he called. We got a meeting, and I flew back and I met the the family attorney, uh, Marty Elgison. I met with the chairman of Hart Shafter Marks, which um, had the brand name. They were the licensor of the name, which was, uh, his name was Bert Hand. And I met with Bob the Fourth, grandson. And we met in Atlanta, and I went into the meeting room, and um, we started talking. And it turned out, Chris, that all three gentlemen obviously were avid golfers, and all three gentlemen had my tri-medals in their bag. So it wow. wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't a, a hard sell. They were very thrilled. They knew that they knew that this would be a smaller type, more modest venture than than what happened at, at Orlemar. But they really felt that it was important to have the the Bobby Jones name on equipment and on high end equipment. And so that's how it started. It started in 2004. Our first line of clubs came out in 2005. So I've been doing this about 11, 12 years now. Wow. I'm talking with uh, renowned club designer Jesse Ortiz here on Next on the T. I've got my next guest, Joe Groman, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Joe in just a minute. Just a couple more before we let you go, Jesse. You've you've got a wonderful beginner's guide to picking the best clubs, you know, for ourselves on on your website, BobbyJonesGolf.com, and and they can find it on BobbyJones.com as well under the equipment link. But talk about how we should go about figuring out what the best clubs are for us. Well, I, I think it starts with looking in the mirror. I think everyone needs to know, like Clint Eastwood says, a man's got to know his limitations. You know, if you're, <laughs> if you're swing, if you're swinging, if your swing speed is 75 or 80 miles an hour, you're not. There's not much that I can do to get you to hit the ball 275 yards. So, what you want to do is really. Take a look at what your swing speed is. What are your abilities? What do you want to get out of the game? You're not going to make get on tour. You're going to what's going to what's going to make you or help you enjoy the game the most. And for most golfers, it's understanding that the the higher you can hit the ball off the tee, the further it's going to go. So you probably should go with something with a little bit more loft. The fairway woods are the same thing. You know, don't get caught up in these 13 and 14, 15 degree fairway woods. Get into something that's going to lift the ball up. Go like 17 or 18 degrees. Get rid of your long irons. Don't hit long irons. Get some hybrids that will help you get the ball airborne. It's about getting the ball airborne as often as you can because you usually get more distance through the air than on the ground. So that, that's where I start, Chris, is look in the mirror and really you know, find out how, how, what your swing speed is. The clubs that you get, you have to put – when you put the club down – at the address position, it's got to look good to you. It's got to give you confidence that you're going to get the ball airborne because the last thing you want is to get a club that uh, when you put it down, it looks awkward to you. It, it, it doesn't look good to the eye because every new club, Chris, has a honeymoon period. After the, Everyone hits the brand new clubs well. After the honeymoon period, though, you're, you, you go, it goes a little south or stale. And if you have a club that's doesn't look good from the beginning you're going to kick yourself in the pants and say yeah i knew this club wasn't right for me it didn't look good so you got to start with what looks good what gives you the confidence when you put the club down behind the ball so loft and how comfortable how much confidence does that club give you and get the right 
get the right shaft. You always go a little lighter and softer than you think because that's going to help you. That's great advice. Yeah, it's interesting to me, Jesse. We talk a lot on this show about uh, about the mental side of the game, and and uh, to your point a moment ago, uh, we've had several you know several uh, instructors say that very same thing is you know your golf club has to inspire confidence because if you're looking down and now you don't you don't like what you see, that impacts the mind, that impacts your ability to play it well, and then you know if uh, to your point that you know the next thing you know you're putting that golf club, uh, either you're trading it in or you're putting it in the, you know, your old golf bag that sits over there with all the, all the clubs that we've gone through because, uh, you just don't believe you can hit it well. And if you don't believe you can hit it well, you're not going to. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Chris. Jesse, one more before we let you go. Talk about what's next. I mean, you, you, your fairway woods and your hybrids are already fantastic. What's coming up next uh, that we can look forward to, whether it's in club innovation or new technologies. Well, I think uh, I don't change, uh, unlike some companies that change models three, four times in a season, I I usually go three years before I change the models. And I will be changing. Um, I've just finished the, the line for next year that will come out in late January or February. I, I don't change models, Chris, just to do it. If I feel that I can make a significant improvement in performance, then that's, that's when I change. And um, the... the there's not much I can do with hybrids. It'll be a new model, but very similar to what I've got. But the driver and fairway woods for next season definitely are going to be hotter. There's some new processes, um, how, how we can attach the faceplate to, uh, to the club's body that's going to make it a little bit hotter. And I think, uh, I think people will see the results um, if they look at my club's next season. So I am working on, on something new. Uh, I'm not going to get into irons, but I'll, I'll stick with uh, drivers, fairway woods, and hybrids. But definitely the next season's products are, are going to be uh, very beautiful, and, and they're going to perform great. It's, uh, there's some things we can do now to make the ball uh, a little hotter off the face and spin a little bit less that are still um, okay with the USGA. Ah, look forward to very much seeing how uh, how those things look and perform. Jesse, let our listeners know, how can they get their hands on your clubs and uh, follow you and the Bobby Jones Golf Company online and on social media as well? Well, we generally sell the equipment directly uh, off off our website, and they can go to bobbyjonesgolf.com or bobbyjonesclubs.com, but I think our main one is bobbyjonesgolf.com. Dot com and they can get all the information there. There's a, there's a phone number there. And actually, if, if people call in, uh, y- usually if you ask for, for my number, they'll, they'll give it to you. You can actually talk to me, and help, I can help you uh, decide which clubs are best for you or answer any other questions about the technology or the lofts or the shafts that they should be using, which is, uh, which is something unusual. It's very hard for you the general public to pick up the phone and be able to talk to the equipment designer. But that's one of the things that I, I enjoy doing. So I, uh, I get quite a few calls each week and, and I'm, I'm just happy to give back to the game. That's, that's been so good to me. And I just love helping people enjoy the gate, this great game of golf. You know, we, we need, uh, we need more players, Chris, the, the yes, industry we do. is, it's, it's, it's tough. We've lost quite a few and the, the demographics aging. So, uh, I'm happy to help people out anytime they call and, and get online. And, and that was one of the, you know, the, the impetus, you know, to, to have you on the show. One of the things that was so impressive, we had Andy Bell, who's the CEO of the Bobby Jones brand on the show a, a few months back or a few weeks back. And uh, one of the things I was talking to Andy offline about, he's like, you know, hey, if you call in about our golf clubs, you know, many times you're going to speak to Jesse Ortiz himself. And to your point, that never happens. It's not rare to happen. It never happens. And he's like, you know, that's one of the most impressive things about Jesse is you got a question, you can talk to Jesse directly. And uh, that's that's absolutely fantastic that you're willing to do that, Jesse. No, no, it's, I, I enjoy it. It's kind of funny because some people, they can't believe they're talking to me. I, am I really talking to you? And most people understand, they, they recognize my voice and they say, wow, it really is you. I didn't think I was going to get you on the phone, but that's what I, that's what I do. I enjoy it. And, uh, um, I, like I said, Chris, I just want to help people enjoy, enjoy the game. That's great, Jesse. Thank you so much 
for taking time out of your morning to be a part of the show. Such a privilege to have you as part of the show this morning, Jesse. I hope you'll come back again soon and you know keep us updated on the things that you're doing. Look forward to the new clubs and designs of the of the drivers in the uh, early part of next year. But uh, it was uh, wonderful having you a part of the show. I hope you'll come back and do it again. That's it, Chris. Thanks for having me on. I've en- I've enjoyed the interview. I I usually don't get a chance to talk about the old days, but it was it was kind of nice reminiscing with you. But thanks for having me on anytime. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Jesse. All the best to you and your family, my friend. Look forward to catching up with you again real soon. Take care, Chris. Thanks. You too, Jesse. That is, again, renowned golf club designer, Jesse Ortiz. And again, you know, check them out online. It's uh, bobbyjonesgolf.com to see all the great, you know, the, the, the designs that they have now and to walk you through, you know, a guide to help you pick out which, uh, you know, which one is best for you. And uh, it's, uh, it's really great information. They're really great golf clubs. I have uh, a couple of the hybrids. Uh, and, uh, boy, just so excited when they came and, uh, they look and feel fantastic, you know, from not, not just from the, you know, the head of the golf club all the way up through the shaft and the, and the, uh, and the grips as well. So very exciting stuff. Can't wait till January, February, see what's coming next, but can't thank Jesse enough for being a part of the show. All right, before I get to my next guest, Joe Groman, I want to give a shout out to our friends over at the World Golf Village. Folks, you heard me at the top of the show, but uh, had the privilege of going down there as my annual guys golf trip with my buddies. We got to play down there. Absolutely wonderful. The golf courses and the, and the resorts. So it's, it's located in historic St. Augustine, Florida, just south of Jacksonville. The World Golf Village is the ultimate golf vacation destination and a true paradise for fans of the game. The village, as it's known by the locals, is the home of the World Golf Hall of Fame as well, where the greatest players and contributors are honored and includes more than 70,000 square feet of displays, trophies, and personal memorabilia. The World Golf Village boasts two championship golf courses. Golf courses, absolutely spectacular, folks. The King and the Bear, co-designed by Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicklaus, and the Sam Snead and Gene Sarazen masterpiece, The Slammer and the Squire. Golfers looking to tune up their game, you can uh, go to their golf school at the uh, PGA Tour uh, Academy. We went there, PGA Golf Academy. It's absolutely fantastic. The folks there treated us fantastic, gave us a lot of really good tips, uh, you know, to help us improve our games. So they've got the latest in learning technology and world-class instructors there as well. A luxurious stay awaits you at the Renaissance Resort at the World Golf Village. We stayed there. It is spectacular. You got an array of amenities there. You got dining options, premier services, folks. No matter the time of year or the length of your visit, the World Golf Village is sure to deliver an unmatched experience with family and friends. You're going to make memories that will last you a lifetime. For more information, go to worldgolfvillage.com or give them a call, 1-800-948-4653. All right, now joining me on the French Lick Resort guest line is Joe Groman. Let me give you some background on Joe. He's been the head uh, professional at uh, Whittier Narrows Golf Course in Rosemead, California, as well as uh, the Chester Washington Golf Course outside of L.A. Since 2005, he's been the head uh, golf professional at the Navy Golf Course at Seal Beach in Cypress, California. He was an international business major at Cal State Fullerton. He's been recognized several times by the Southern California PGA, including in 2012 as the SC PGA President's Award and in 2013 as the SCPGA Professional of the Year. Back in 2010, he received the Armed Forces Recognition Award, and in 2008, he won the Navy Weapons Station Seal Beach Employee of the Year Award. And I'm very excited that uh, he is here uh, with me on Next on the Tee. Good morning, Joe. Thanks for being a part of the show. Chris, how are you? Thanks for having me. How about Jesse? Ah, That was very interesting, man. I think uh, everybody had that tri-metal in their bag at one point. Yeah, yeah, me too. I had the three and the four wood in my bag right. once upon a time. So great stuff. But yeah, Joe, awesome. let's uh, let's go back to the beginning for you. Uh, always curious to understand, you know, where where you know our guests developed the love for the game and who first put a golf club in your hands. Well, you know, I, I grew up on Air Force bases, and uh, when I was about six years old, there was a, a set of McGregor's in the garage since I can remember. And then when I was six, I hit one of the zippers and there was a little white ball in there. So I said, I know what this is. And, uh, you know, proceeded to try to smack the driver across the road into a field on base and, uh, took 19 times, but I finally hit it. It was a little screamer, hit the curb, ricocheted, went right through the neighbor's window. Oh. I was hooked. <laughs> that was my first shot in golf right there so, you know they had junior programs on base uh 
Jim Hickey was a big influence back then. He uh, he was on the Olympic bobsled team. He ran that at Lake Placid. Plattsburgh Air Force Base was in upstate New York. So yeah, um, I got to give a lot of credit to Jim Hickey to teach me the love of the game and moved out to California when I was 17. And, you know, that's, tw- that's uh, 365 of golf. So, you know, it was on after that. And, you know, Joe, for our listeners here on the Armed Forces Radio Network, talk about – you know, your, your family's military background and how you first got involved uh, with the Navy as well. Uh, my dad uh, flew F-4s and FB-111s for the Air Force. You know, I was born in McDill in Tampa. And uh, we got we went to Homestead for a year or so. When I was about six, we got transferred to Plattsburgh Air Force Base in upstate New York. And then, uh, you know, retired at 17, well, I didn't retire, but uh, when I was 17, they retired. And uh, my stepfather at the time got a job with Northrop out here at Pico Rivera in Southern California. So um, it was either finish my my uh, senior year of high school in upstate New York or come to Southern California. So that was a pretty easy decision there. And, um, you know, the, the military out here, when when I was looking for a job, after college it just happened to be that the navy golf course was hiring and you know and i was born and raised on military golf courses so i thought it was a perfect fit for me so i got the job there i was 24 years old and uh, at the time uh, it's been a great fit you know i was Mm -hmm. there for nine years in the tiger days and you know i did my little stint at Hartwell, Whittier Narrows, and Chester, Washington. I've been back at Navy since 2005, so it's been it's been real awesome. It's been a blessing. And you know, like I say, and you know, like you just mentioned a moment ago, uh, you know, you've got a strong history, you know, there at the Navy Golf Course, and uh, spent some time around a pretty good golfer named Tiger Woods, who really got his start out there at the Navy Golf Course, right? Yeah, absolutely. It was it was kind of interesting. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, basically how it worked was the Navy golf course was 26 miles from the Long Beach Naval Station, which we were affiliated with. So, you know, that's that's through hard traffic. So there was no real kids at the golf course. I remember uh, when I first got there, you know, I was telling the head pro, because Jim Hickey, who I mentioned earlier, had done this pay it forward thing. He took care of us at Plattsburgh. But he said, someday when you're in a position to, you need to pay this forward. You need to work. You need to help out some kids when you get older. And that kind of stuck with me. So we go to, I get the job at Navy. I'm finally excited. I'm in a position to pay this forward. And I'm telling the head pro at the time this story. And he says, well, you know, we're 26 miles from the base. You know, you know, we don't, other than a week long junior program during the summer, we don't have any kids here at the Navy golf course. I was kind of bummed, and he goes, well, we got one. And I said, well, one's better than none. Right. And it turns out that our one was Tiger. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, we took good care of Tiger there. He was 13 at the time when I showed up at Navy. So from 13 till he turned pro, you know, we literally had him all to ourselves. So it was pretty awesome. And and I read a quote from you that I got a chuckle out of uh, where you said, I used to kick Tiger Woods' butt. Uh, I used to kick Tiger Woods' butt regularly. Then he turned 12. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, talk about being out there with is, when he was a kid. That's Dave Stevens' quote. He's a, he was a pro at Lakewood. Trust me, that's Dave Stevens' quote. I, uh, unfortunately – Never beat Tiger. I tied him twice. I probably played 500 rounds of golf with him. But I remember the very first time that I played with him, I didn't know who he was. I played with him and his dad uh, one Saturday. I met his dad about two weeks before I met Tiger. And that's an interesting story, too. But when I finally played with him, you know, I just thought it was just some, you know, air, uh, army brat. I just thought it was a dependent kid. But he was, uh, he was awesome, you know, and he beat me by a couple shots and I remember being so mad I had to walk off the 18 and compose myself and then turn around and and you know say you know uh great job all that you know great playing with you and then walking off the green I told Earl I go Earl you got to get this kid into junior golf he's the best I've seen at any age and he goes you never heard of my son and I hadn't you know I'd been kind of out of golf for a few years and 
he goes, come in the lounge and we'll talk about it. And then he told me, you know, about the five junior worlds and the Rolex and the insurance shoes classic. I mean, Tiger had won tournaments. And when I was a junior golfer, I just wanted to get into Tiger and won them all. And so I, I knew he was really special, you know, right at the beginning. So mm-hmm. we did all we could to, to coach and mentor and keep him uh, supplied with golf balls and positiveness. So talk about meeting his father. You said that's an interesting story. I'm curious to hear. Well, Earl was very cool. You know, when I first start, showed up at Navy, mind you, it was military only at the time. We're so far from the base. It's all retirees. And, you know, at first they're kind of, it's almost like their own private little country club at the time. And Earl was the first guy to come in and see me, shake my hand, welcome me to Navy. It took the other guys a few weeks, so I was really happy about that. But when, so I, I was talking to him. Now, when I first uh, started working at Navy, they threw me right into teaching golf. And I played all the way through college without ever having a lesson, which is, you know, wow. I only could get so good. And yeah, it was, yeah, but that's, that's not a, an impressive feat. It was, you don't want to do it that way. So I was telling Earl, you know, because I was out there, you know, and I'm sure right now there's some guy crying in the closet for what I did to his golf swing because, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you've never had a golf lesson, you really aren't going to know how to give a golf lesson. So <laughs> I was complaining to Earl. He's very nice. You know, I mean, it was so quiet back then. You, I mean, me and Earl many times would sit in the shop and you could smoke back then in the shop, sit there. We'd talk for four hours many times and talk about golf and uh you know, we became very close. That's an, you know, another story. But I was telling him, you know, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. He goes, oh, I'd be happy. He tells me I'd be happy to help you. You know, this is like the second or third time. I've, so I go running out after he leaves to look on the handicap uh, charts out there. And Earl was a one handicap, which no, you know, not a lot of people know how good Earl was back then. Wow. So I was very excited because the guy that's going to help me decipher these golf swings is a one. So that was great. In fact, there was uh, only one only one handicap better tiger was like a plus 2.5 at the time and he's 13 wow can you imagine so no the funny story was when uh i went so me and earl are hitting it off he starts giving me some lessons myself you know he's starting to teach me because you know one thing that always bothered me was i could only get so good and i never knew why and that was probably i felt because i wasn't getting instruction so it's been about two weeks you know me and earl are hitting it off and I have a lesson with him. I go out to the range and he's talking to this kid, you know, and, and the kid, and he's saying something, kids just keeps hitting balls, doesn't acknowledge him or nothing. Keeps hitting balls, keeps hitting balls. And finally I can't stand it any longer. I go, listen, young man, you want to listen to this guy. He knows what he's talking about. And Tiger looked over at me with the funniest look you ever saw. Earl started laughing so hard. He was sitting on uh, one of those little things you lean your clubs against. Mm-hmm. Those little club holder things. He starts laughing yeah. so hard he fell over off of it. <laughs> it was kind of funny. <laughs> and he goes, Joe, you don't know my son Tiger. And I was like embarrassed. And that was my meeting with Tiger. But it's wow. interesting. Me and Earl went down to the other end of the range. And uh, I said, why do you come down here? And he goes, well, first of all, I don't want Tiger thinking about what I'm thinking about. And secondly, he knows where to find me if he needs me. And I thought as a young man, you know, at the time, I thought, man, that is an awesome thing for a dad to say. He's going to, because you see that all the time with kids in your junior programs and stuff that, you know, they'll hit a shot and then they'll look over at their dad for approval or mom, you know, and they'll right. hit a shot. But, you know, Earl had, you know, understood that and left him alone. Um, another interesting story on that was the first time I played with both of them was, Earl, and I'm sure you've heard about it on the, in the news or, you know, they've reported on this, but it was true. Uh, we're playing, and, like, every time Tiger would hit a shot, Earl would start talking like I'm talking to you, just loud and start jiggling his chains. Not anybody else, just Tiger, every shot. And it was like, I thought, man, that is so rude. So, like, <laughs> on the fifth hole, <laughs> Tiger's putting. Earl starts talking. And I shushed him. I go, oh, shh. Earl looks up at me so surprised and doesn't miss a beat. He goes, Joe, don't you know what I'm doing? 
Tiger's still continuing putting, makes his putt. I go, you know, I look around the rest of the guys. I go, no. He goes, I'm preparing Tiger to be able to play through the distraction when he makes it on the tour. Wow. Like, oh, my God, what an awesome thing for a dad to say. And uh, I was walking off the green with, with Tiger, and I said, does he really do that every time you, you hit? Tiger said, I don't know. I haven't heard anything in two years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very cool. Earl was just a, a very – you know, an awesome dad in that respect. And, uh, you know, and he, and he didn't force anything down his throat. I remember one time Tiger was about 14 and you got to understand they lived about a mile from the course. So every day after school, Tiger was there every weekend when he didn't have a tournament, Tiger was there sun up to sundown all the time. And again, he's our only kid. So it's obvious and we're not busy. So he, he has a place to himself. And so like after a year, I'm like, um, I said, Earl, what would you do if he wanted to quit? And he said, that would be fine. That would be his decision. He said, I am only here to to provide the foundation for success. As long as Tiger is a productive member of society, I'm going to support him in any endeavor he undertakes. And I thought, man, that was awesome, you know. No doubt. You know, yeah, he was awesome. A lot of good so, times. Some of the other things that I read about, you know, their time there is that, you know, there were a small minority of folks there that weren't always happy that they were out there. So you had to come over and overcome some, some early uh, race issues as well. Did you, did you see that too? I got all the stories, Chris, I assure you. Um, yeah, I was right in the middle of that. You know, uh, I took Earl and Tiger were, were my, you know, I caddied for Tiger and his regional junior stuff. And there, I was very close to him. I played golf with Earl every Wednesday for five years. So there was a, a, a vocal minority that, you know, I was close to all the members, you know, all the military people. And they, they felt, uh, you know, they could talk to me. So a lot of them, you know, not a lot of them, but the, you know, they were very comfortable uh, complaining to me, you know, with their displeasure, uh, it, it was just, you know, looking back, it was just a weird time in the world. It was like there were so many of these awesome, you know, retired military veterans, World War II guys, you know, and it, 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 they were just amazing human beings. And then they just had this weird little uh, glitch, I like to say. Uh, it, but it was just like, you know, these guys were raised, in the days of segregation and they just didn't know any better back then, you know? And, and I mean, today we've obviously come a long way, but, right. um, um, you know, without getting too deep into that. Yeah. I, I was aware of all of it and, uh, it was unfortunate. It was, a, it, you know, I don't want to name names or anything, but it could have been sure. a lot better. I mean, I feel, uh, I feel the Navy missed an opportunity to have the greatest recruiting tool they could ever hope for in Tiger Woods and instead uh, you know in particular one person who could have made it uh, you know made it all go away uh, chose to not do that so Mm -hmm. so what was uh, the switch you know because you know as I was reading through all of that stuff I mean you know when he won the U.S. Amateur he you know I'd read that he had offered to let them display the trophy there but they really didn't you know acknowledge him didn't acknowledge you know the accomplishment and how good that he really was, but, you know, at some point, right. The the club had to move beyond that small minority of folks and and start treating him. Right. Was, was there a, was there a time when, you know, the flip, you know, the, the switch uh, got flipped and they started to embrace him more. Yeah. When I got back in 2005, um, back then when Tiger was doing all that stuff, the, the, the switch was off. And And the thing that, the very thing that you just mentioned about the trophy was the straw that broke the camel's back for Tiger. Um, You know, two weeks earlier, uh, a guy had kicked, uh, I don't even know if I want to go into this, but, but uh, the, uh, yeah, that that not displaying, not displaying the trophy um, was the straw that broke the camel's back for him. It was like, and that was after an incident had happened a couple weeks earlier. That was, Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it couldn't have ended worse 
if you ask me for uh for that for tiger um so has that changed? Yeah, what had happened was, I know, you know, this is tough for me to talk about. It, it was, it was really, it was very sad for uh, me and the other assistant pro Scott Bon F there because you know we love this kid. He was such an awesome kid, and like you said, this yeah, this certain uh, person could have displayed the trophy and uh, made life a lot easier on to, on Tiger. Um, uh, but. The uh, yeah, so right after that, you know, he went off to college, and um, it, it was. I mean, if if we had just uh, done that, I mean, everything would have been fine. But the, the, just the last two little things, it was. It, yeah, it was pretty heartbreaking. I Hard bet it was. To talk about right now, yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, there was another incident. He got kicked off the range. I get a phone wow. call from the neighborhood and the lady said there's a couple guys hitting balls into the neighborhood. So every once in a while we get a couple drunk sailors and they just turn around and start hitting balls in the neighborhood. I don't know why just alcohol. Yeah. So I go running out there, tigers hitting balls. He's the only guy in the range. And, uh, I said, Hey champ, I go, you see any guys, uh, by the way, his nickname's champ. <laughs> so <laughs> you ever get out no. earshot to say, Hey champ. And he'll, he'll, he still answers to that. I'm sure. So anyway, he goes, yeah, they went uh, around maintenance because people could go around maintenance and sneak on the course. So I drove out there, and you could also jump back into the neighborhood. So I go around, and no one's – I don't see him. I go on the course, you know, and I'm out of the shop, so I'm taking my time, right? I'm looking around. No one's out there. No one's out I come back, and Tiger's balls are sitting there on the range, and Tiger's gone. So immediately I thought something happened to Earl because Tiger would never leave balls on the range. Um, I go running in. I go, what happened? What happened? And Scotty, you know, he's got tears in his eyes. And he said this certain person kicked him off the golf course. I'm like, what? So I go running down. This guy's a retired uh, Marine colonel. And I said, Bill, what did you do? He said, a neighbor lady called, said, little black kid is hitting balls into the neighborhood. I go, Bill, that's BS. I took the phone call. You know, so this guy had a had it for him, and then this other guy that was in a position of power had it out for him. So they, so they kicked Tiger Woods, wow. <laughs> who had won the U.S. Amateur Trophy two weeks earlier, <laughs> off out of the golf course. The U.S. Amateur Champion. So I was I was so upset. I go running over there to their house, and this there was there was sort of a pattern of this. And at the time, there was a three-star general that was a friend of mine in there, named General Lyles. He's, he was an African American general, very cool guy. And so I go running over there, and it's like a funeral parlor. Tiger had obviously already told. I, I go running over to their house. Tiger had obviously already told their parents what had happened. It's just. You know, they're just silent and quiet, and I'm like, um, which I can understand. So I said, Earl, I go, Earl, you want me to tell General Isles what's been going on out here? And he's all, no, no, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. And so then I go to Tita, I go, Tita, do you want me to tell General Isles? You know, we don't need no, we don't need that damn Navy. Then I go to Tiger. Hey, champ, you want me to tell General Lyles what's going on? And they did, you know, obviously they didn't. They're very gracious, and they were above that. But it was so heartbreaking. The U.S. Amateur Champion gets th- Tiger, of course. So I say that story to say even after that happened to him, when he got the trophy, he was gracious enough to approach the golf course to put it, to display it. And the person in charge at that time who – uh, who was I, I can't mention his name but he was in on all the shenanigans did not even have the courtesy to reply to Tiger's request Wow! and that was what broke the camel's back for Tiger I bet it was and uh, and uh, yeah and um I think he came, I think he played maybe one more time when he came back from college, maybe two more times. He just 
get out of his car and jump on the tee and then immediately leave, maybe two more times, just as, just playing with his dad and his buddies, uh, his dad's buddies that were close with Tiger. But that was it, and that was it. And so people ask, you know, does he ever come back? Does he ever come back? And I'm like, well, that was kind of his farewell party, but no. So, you know, I want him to know that I'm back at Navy. We'll close the whole course for him if he wants to come back and play, you know. And, but that was that was just such a tragedy because – you know, we're so close to – he's going to college. He's going to turn pro, and you send him off with this. So, obviously, when I mentioned the Navy missed out on their greatest recruiting tool they could have ever had, there you go. That's why. There you, know. you go. So, yeah. Joe- but, on a, you know, on a positive note, <laughs> on a positive note, the book, that that little book, How to Golf Beginner's Guide. Yeah. That – was Earl's idea. Here, here's the story behind that. So, the the Marines, the Air Force, and the Army guys that would go on deployment for six months, if they're too handicapped, they'd come back. They'd be a too handicapped. The sailors, when they go on deployment for six months, if they're a too handicapped, they'd come back and they'd be a forty handicap. It was unbelievable. It was all of them were like, "What is going on here?" So Earl figured out. That it's, you know, and there are hitting balls. They're hitting balls off the ship. So Earl figured out that it's like the running water or practicing while you're moving was just destroying their swings. you never seen anything like it. Wow. So we came up with that book. Um, we're going to do, you know, the, I don't, I don't, I need to send you a copy. But basically inside it's pictures, it's big pictures, and then one and two sentence descriptions that's, in huge print so you can actually lay it down on the ground and still read it and follow the print the idea behind that was you don't really want to read how to golf you want to see how to golf. so we we put this thing together so they could keep their swings together and then you know the idea everybody loved it tiger was going to post for the pictures it's going to be great we're going to have this thing for the sailors and then they closed long beach naval station so we're like you know well we don't have any more sailors to to uh, make this book for. So then after Tiger had, uh, in 94, I was still at Navy, but I started working at Hartwell Golf Course, which was huge juniors. They had like the third largest non-PGA affiliated junior program in the country. So in like 94, Tiger wins his first U.S. amateur. So this is about two years or three years after the idea of the book. So he wins the amateur and I'm like, hey, that's, that's huge. That's so big. I go, so I reapproached him with the idea, let's just do this book, but instead of doing it for sailors, let's do it for kids. So wow. they agreed to do it. So the day before the shoot, I called the NCAA. I didn't mention any names, and I said, hey, uh, I got this Division One athlete, and I'm doing this instruction book. Is there any problems with that? And they're all, you can't even mention his name. So I was so bummed out. Really? I go over to their house, and I tell them, I go, I just called the NCAA. They said you can't pose for these pictures, which is, I, you know, I wish I'd still had them pose for the pictures. I regret that. But Earl said right there without missing a beat, I'll, I'll write the foreword to the book. Sight unseen. We haven't laid one word down. Earl's going to write the foreword. I'm like, heck yeah, okay. <laughs> so what we did is uh, one of my – one of my students was the vice president of Nikon or one of the camera companies. So I sent a staff photographer over to take the pictures. And what I do is I take the pictures and I take post-it notes, write down what I wanted to say. And then we would go over to Earl's house and me and Earl and Tiger would go over the verbiage on the little post-it notes. Because since Earl's going to write the forward, I want him in on every single word we put down. Right. So that's how uh, that came about. And uh, and we did the book. I posed for the pictures, and uh, Earl wrote the forward. I got a picture of me and Tiger on the front and back covers and some pictures right. inside from the day. But uh, that's how that book came about. And it's still available, right? I, I saw it out on Amazon.com. People can go out there and take a, and get their copy of it. Is that, is that still right? Well, if they're on Amazon, it's bootleg. They can go to howtogolf.com to get uh, – to get it from me but uh everything's on amazon now you know um, yeah go to howtogolf.com 
we're gonna we're in the process of making it an ebook, but for hard copy that you can throw right in your golf bag. You know, I designed it just specifically for that. This thing's this thing is uh it's got it all. It's how to golf beginner's guide, it's got um uh etiquette, helpful hints, plus the instruction, chipping, putting, full swing. Um yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. I, you know, the, the the websites out there hiding in the in you know you just howtogolf.com type it up, it'll pop up. Uh, I got about 600 hard copies left, is all. I haven't really been pumping up the uh, the book sales because I use a lot of these books when I do these inner city clinics and all these other clinics I give the kids. So, um, but you can still get it on howtogolf.com. Great. Joe, uh, one more before we let you go and really want to, you know, end on the, on a positive side and, and, and you do some, you know, great work as the chairman of the board uh, for the Southern California disabled golf committee. Talk about the work that you're doing there. Well, uh, Monday, we just had our 17th annual golf clinic for the junior blind, which is one of my favorites. And Earl actually helped me put together the very first one. So his legacy kind of lives on in that. We just had our 11th annual special ed kids clinic uh, earlier. We I go down to Camp Pendleton once a month and do a wounded warrior clinic for the Marines down there. Uh, I ran the Marine Corps trials because they added golf to it, which is where all the wounded warriors from around the country go to Pendleton and they do archery and bowling. They added golf this year, so that was a lot of fun. We go to the Long Beach VA Hospital. Uh, we Once a quarter, they come to Navy and – once a quarter, we go there for the ones that are too seriously disabled to even get it out. They have a big putting green. They built one of the alcoves. We have a great time with them. Uh, we've started a, a wounded warrior clinic at Fort Gordon in Augusta the Monday of Masters Week. We'll be going back this year. We started one last year for the Sony wounded warrior clinic at the Kaneohe Clipper Marine Base in uh, Hawaii which was awesome. There's a lot of uh, military presence on Oahu, so it was kind of cool to, to get that. Um, when the uh, PGA Foundation needs to do a, a Project Hope showcase clinic, they send me out there to wherever to, to show the, the PGA pros from that community how it's done and, and do one and have a great time with it. What else? Oh, we just did an inner city uh, clinic. The first annual, I went down to Chester, Washington. As you mentioned earlier, I was a pro there. After I left Navy the first time, I was at Chester, Washington in South Los Angeles. Uh, it's in the hood, and I was there for four years. Awesome kids. So we went back this year, you know, uh, you know, because of the, the, the climate out there, the racial climate so bad, I said, I need to get back there, you know, and show these kids we still love them and care about them. So we went back. We had a huge clinic down there with uh, the Lenox Sheriff Station Youth Authority kids, the troubled kids. So they had a blast. We had a blast. We're going to do that every year. Some of the instructors there, you know, already started a weekly program out of that clinic. So, we, you know, we do a lot of stuff. We got our hands in and having a, a lot of fun with these rehabilitative golf clinics. That's fantastic stuff. We can't thank you enough for, for doing those sorts of things for our, uh, for our wounded warriors. We, uh, we are very um, in tune with, you know, those sorts of things. We, you know, the, the Salute Military Golf Association is a is an organization that uh, we try to promote as well. Jim Estes, you know, PGA professional, doing some great things for our wounded uh, veterans here on the uh, on the East Coast. So we can't thank you enough for doing that. Those sorts of things for our wounded warriors on the West Coast. Joe, great stuff. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate that, and it's all team effort, all volunteers, and. Uh, uh, I'm just the guy who gets to have the most fun. Ah, good for you. Joe, um, thank you so much for taking time out of your morning to be a part of the show. You were absolutely fantastic. I hope you'll come back and do it again sometime, update us on the, on all the great things that you're doing, and uh, share more of your stories with you because I've really enjoyed the, the time that I've gotten to spend with you today. Well, I appreciate that, Chris. Yeah, anytime. Let me know. LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right, Joe. Thank you so much again. All the best to you and your family. I look forward to the opportunity to catch up with you again real soon. Great. Sounds good, Chris. Thank you. You too, my my friend. Bye-bye. Take care, Joe. That is Joe Groman again, PGA professional out there at the uh, at the Navy Golf Course at Seal Beach in uh, in Cypress, California. Uh, inter- very interesting stories. And again, his uh, his book. It's you can find it on 
howtogolf.com, howtogolf.com. And uh, like I said, as you put, maybe there's some uh, you know, uh, copies out there available on amazon.com as well that have been hanging around. But again, howtogolf.com. Joe Groman in uh, Joe Spouse's last name, G-R-O-H-A-M. So check him out online. You can find him on LinkedIn. And the uh, book is fantastic. Look forward to getting a copy of that book myself. All right, folks, it is time for me to put a bow on on this episode. But before we close up shop, like we just said a moment ago, I want to remind you about our friends over at the over at the Salute Military Golf Association and PGA Tour professional Jim Messes. They're doing such great work there. Let's hear a word uh, from Jim about what they're doing. The Salute Military Golf Association was created to provide rehabilitative golf experiences to the brave men and women who have been wounded while serving our country. Hi, I'm Jim Estes, PGA Golf Pro and co-founder of the Salute Military Golf Association. With my adaptive golf program, we've successfully helped thousands of soldiers in their recovery, both mentally and physically. The SMGA has been providing family-inclusive golf experiences across the country since 2007. To date, the SMGA has equipped more than 1,000 warriors with properly fitted golf clubs and has extended its clinic series to more than eight chapter and affiliate locations across the U.S. If you are a wounded veteran interested in participating or if you'd like to learn more about the Salute Military Golf Association and find a chapter closest to you, visit our website at smga.org. We've seen firsthand how impactful golf can be in aiding one's recovery. The Salute Military Golf Association, empowering wounded veterans one fairway at a time. Visit smga.org. That's smga.org. Yeah, Jim and his uh, his team, they are doing some amazing things there at the Salute Military Golf Association. Can't thank them enough for their dedication uh, to uh, to helping our wounded warriors. To find out more information, go to smga.org and see how you can get involved. All right, everyone, uh, my sincere thanks again to Jesse Ortiz and Joe Groman for uh, making today's uh, show so much fun and so informative. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Please also check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me and my co-host, Bob Lazari, and our announcer, Joe Lajanusa. That show airs live every Thursday night from 8 and 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You can stream it live on Blog Talk Radio. It's also available on the Armed Forces Radio Network at armedforcesradionetwork.org. You can also stream or download it uh, on uh, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, Player.fm, SoundCloud, Podbean. We are all over the net. You can take us with you everywhere you go. Stream us you know, live, whether it's in your car or you're out and about at the store or grocery store, mall, wherever you're at, you can uh, take us there, there with you as well. We are joined every week on Thursday Night Tailgate by legends and stars uh, from around the NFL. We're official partners of the NFL Alumni Association. Uh, please check out both shows on Facebook. Give us a like. That's important to us, too. Next on the Tea with Chris Mascaro, Thursday Night Tailgate. Uh, you can also find us online. This show, nextonthetea.net and ThursdayNightTailgate.com. From either site, you can stream or download any of our archive episodes for free folks and keep up to date with who some of our future guests are going to be as well. I can't thank you and again, uh, thank you enough for choosing to listen to this show today. We appreciate you so very much. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. You've been listening to Next on the T with Christmas Carol. Where PGA and LPGA are legends, pros and top instructors And media members go to tell their stories Join us the same time every Saturday To hear more stories about the game we love From the people who love sharing those stories with you It's all about the great game of golf It's all about the great game of golf